we're going to be talking about some uh, some interesting things around prospecting that you've discovered. But uh, maybe if you want to give us like, your 30 second intro and maybe share one interesting thing that we might not know about you. Sure. This is working, right? Okay. So I, um, I'm Liz Kane. I run business development for NetSuite. I have a team of about 150 individual contributors now, spanning, uh, I guess, six sites in North America, London, Sydney, and Singapore. So we've got a pretty large global team. I've got a whole bunch of NetSuite people here right now for managers on my team, our sales team, um, which is awesome. Uh, as far as what's interesting, I was kind of laughing about this earlier, but every time we start a team, we do that like really awkward introductions. You have to give one fun fact about yourself that no one knows. So I was like thinking through my list of these and what to share, but I'm not really gonna bore you with those. Um, my, I'm an avid traveler, and so my fun fact is that I will never end a vacation without the next one planned. Oh, nice. I like that. Good, good, good plan. Uh, you know, me, me and travel planning, it's always last minute for me. I'm, I'm terrible at that. Uh, so I want to guess kicked off, uh, we'll talk about more like the prospecting stuff in a little bit, but I want to know a little bit more about what it took to actually build a team from scratch. And you know, what was your journey at, at, at Suite? You know, what was the team that you were building? How did that even come about? And and maybe even before that, maybe just share a little bit yeah. about what NetSuite is, because you know, what I knew NetSuite was, you know, back in back when it started, it's definitely expanded over the past like, 15 year, 15 plus years that's been around. Yeah, absolutely. So NetSuite is a cloud ERP provider. I'm supposed to say the number one cloud ERP provider. Mm -hmm. um, so we will run any part of your business from back end financials to front end uh, customer relationship management, e commerce, really spanning all the different business departments you have. Um, I joined a much smaller company, OpenAir, about eight years ago, and that is a project management software company. There were probably 40 to 50 employees when I joined, and I was doing tech support for them, and it was really fun. Like, I loved being on the phone. I was talking to clients every day, um, and if they had had a sales program back then, I probably would have been part of that. Uh, I did that for about a year and a half. I got some really interesting exposure to our customers. I learned a lot about how they use our product and the value they were finding in it. And when they got acquired by NetSuite, we ended up outsourcing that team to the Philippines. So I literally trained the person that replaced me for like a seventh of the price point. <laughs> and we had that like really tough call on a Friday where it was, all right, you guys are gonna come in on Monday and you don't have this job anymore, so what do you wanna do? <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, I had some really good advice at the time. Our COO and President Jim McGeever was in town, and I was definitely over a couple of drinks, but I was having a conversation with him, and he said, you know, what do you want to do? And I was really naive and announced that I wanted his job. Like, that's <laughs> definitely what I wanted to do one day. So he gave a, a great piece of advice, and he said, if you want to be in a C-suite, or if you want to have an operational role in a company, you need to understand where the revenue comes from. And his advice was go figure out how to get into the sales team. And at that point, I had an offer to do sales operations, and I was working for our head of sales doing kind of whatever he needed that day. <laughs> and it was running forecast calls back in the day, it was negotiating contracts, it was mostly booking orders, um, planning territories, like anything. Uh, I did that for about a year and a half, and then they were looking for someone to start an open air account management team, and it was the product I had run, but in a um, retention management role within our organization. And I was 23 and I had never sold before and I had never managed before, so naturally, I did that job. Yeah, it made a lot of sense. Uh, I took a pretty big quota and hired a, for the first team of reps. So we hired in five reps from the outside. I had three that I inherited. And we finished that year as the top performing account management team in the company, which was really exciting. So I got to the end of that year and this is sort of like the evolution of where this program that I now run started. But I got a call from our CEO who was basically like, okay, all these new people hit their quota. That's not like often the case in their first few months <laughs> at NetSuite. Um, what happened there? Like, what did you do? And at the same time, we had this person over here, Rob, jumping up and down screaming about leads, saying my sales reps need leads. Like, how are we gonna solve these problems? And so it, it kind of came from two places. One was we needed to generate more leads as a company. And then the second was that we needed to figure out how to grow ERP sales reps internally. And we wanted to solve that by having this high energy, um, 
kind of young college campus hiring, train them for a year and move them into our business model. So the first year that we did it, uh, I thought they were gonna be like, here, like take five people, like see what you can do. And instead we got headcount for 20 and we hired that group in um, and showed a lot of early success and it's evolved from there. We started bringing in managers, we started bringing in directors, operations, recruiting, um, and now we're up to about 150. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> 150. It's a lot. In, in six six different regions as well, right? Mm-hmm. Wow. In nine offices now. <coughs> yeah, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about just you know, that aspect of um, just growing a team yeah. very rapidly as well and kind of some of the things that you learned from that. But I want to dive in on, on one aspect of what you mentioned, ERP, that's a really complex <laughs> technology, right? It's not something you just kind of you know, swipe a credit card and someone loads it up. You have no. implementers, it takes a while. So what have you kind of learned in this process of trying to you know, sell or build leads with a very complex solution? Yeah. Was it like a framework? I mean, how did you even like go about developing that for folks who literally, as you said, right out of college? <laughs> well, yeah, I might start with the fact that I was so hell-bent on everybody learning the product when we started, and we spent like weeks in training and invested in everybody learning like every aspect of what the software does. Right. And we've moved further and further away from that as we've done years of classes. And that's a really good thing. Um, so we're focusing far more on learning the value of what we're providing to the client rather than how to create the red button on that page. Um, so I think we've first kind of changed our training model and focused more on the customer rather than the product, which is great. Um, and then as far as the prospecting model goes, I mean, there's a lot of things we can touch on there. I think the first is, we all know what the goal is. We're trying to get somebody live on the phone. These are the stats that I'm going to share that I get to read. Yes. Right? Okay. All right. Um, so there was, um, there's been a whole ton of different studies done, and I'm sure you guys have seen some of the ones done with, by MIT or Kellogg. The most recent one was published in the Harvard Business Review um, just a couple months ago, and they studied 15,000 leads and more than 100,000 cold calls into these companies. And what they found was pretty compelling and actually right in line with what they've been saying for quite a while. So number one, Wednesdays and Thursdays are the best days to call. Best days to call to connect, best days to call to qualify, and then they have specific hours within those days. So eight to 9 a.m. and four to 5 p.m. continue to outperform any other time of day. And if you call somebody between eight and 9 a.m. versus 12 to 1 p.m., which is the lowest connect rate, you're 164% more likely to connect, which is huge. Wow. Yeah, so, so that's a big one. So I mean, already, like, like right there, you can build just like eliminate plan your day. Huge, yeah, plan your day. Imagine, imagine that, planning your day as a I know. sales professional. Um, but, but it's really hard, right? Like you actually do have to schedule that time, but scheduling it at the right times is one of the things that's really key. Yeah, I, I just think that like, if we get so hell-bent crazed with all these things, we're working deals, right? Yeah. And you've probably heard this like so many times from reps, like, oh, I'm, I'm busy working the, my deals, I don't have time to prospect. I mean, what, what's your perspective on just like planning that out? I mean, do you actually like build your calendar? What, what are the things that have kind of worked for you? Yeah, so within our team, so my, my team is purely focused on lead generation. We're not in a closing capacity, so let me start with that and then we'll kind of talk about our broader sales work. Um, within our team, yes, we're absolutely encouraging people to plan their day and the things to plan are the, are, are the things that have to get done, right? So if you're gonna do a call block or you're gonna commit to dialing for two hours a day, I guarantee you'll hit your activity metrics, plan it at the right time, and prioritize it, and make sure that you actually hold yourself accountable to doing that time. Um, and then we're planning in prospecting time. So prospecting for us is the act of researching and actually figuring out what's going on with that company. Calling is a separate activity, and doing those two things separately is really important. So right. keep yourself really focused, right? Laser focused on, I'm gonna research these 20 accounts, I'm gonna find the right contacts, I'm gonna find um, their direct lines, I'm gonna find their email addresses, so that when I go to call later, I can literally sit down and make 50 calls, and I have this clean list where I can just bang it out. Um, so absolutely, scheduling it, prioritizing it. Um, Kelly actually said something awesome to me today, which was she plans proactive time versus reactive time. And I thought that was a really good way to think of it, right? So blocking the time on your calendar where you can be creative or you can, you know, cut down your to-do list or you can, you know, actually make your dials, making sure that time is sacred and that it's not, you know, consumed by the current fire drill. 
Yeah, I think that's what happens so so often is that you get consumed by the fire yeah. drill and you just like everything goes like hell in the hat hand basket yeah. and nothing gets done ultimately. But you look at the end of the day, it's like, oh, what did I get done? Mm -hmm. Right, the scheduling is so important. Yeah, you brought this really interesting point about research. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I see people just like, the way that they research. It's like. They're trying to get the Encyclopedia Britannica of like information on a prospect. I mean, that just seems wasteful. Yeah. I mean, what do you think actually makes sense when you do prospect research? Yeah. So we partner with a company called Boresight, so I'm going to completely rip off their model right now, but I love it. Boresight? Oh, Boresight. No. Boresight with a V. Yeah, Boresight. Yeah. Uh, that's Steve Richard. Steve Richard, yeah. yeah Tom Snyder. Uh, great company. They do a lot of prospecting training, but their methodology is one that we've really adopted internally, and they call it three by three. So three pieces of information in three minutes or less. And you do not need more than that to call. So figuring out what that process is for you is probably different depending on your industry and the size of companies, right? Do, right. You, do you wanna look at the local business journals? Do you wanna Google? Do you need to check LinkedIn? Like you figure out what your process is and the few places you check. Google's a really good one, Google News. Like if you can find the name, the person you're calling, Google them and the company, you're probably gonna find something you can mention. Um, and the idea is just to be relevant. Find, find something that's a hook in that first 30 seconds when you're on the phone. You, you don't need to go so deep. Um, so yeah, we, we're focusing on limited amount of time, high impact. Yeah, that makes sense. What about direct also? Because that's something that I think a lot of people complain about is just hitting switchboards. I, mean, mm -hmm. I just spend so much time just navigating switchboards. Have you found like something that actually works just to get, get the direct dials if you can share that? I don't have an awesome trick for that because I think it does take a lot of work still. It's, it's I know. So um, we do use a couple of tools to help support it. So we use a company called LeadSpace. Um, I, there's a whole bunch of different ones out there, um, but, you know, providing some sort of validated contact yeah. information that they're scraping from a whole bunch of different resources. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I've seen everything from folks using I think like Zoom Info yeah. or you know, Rain King. Reach Forms, yeah. yeah. Uh, also like outsourcing a lot of that as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that that goes on. Uh, yeah, just in terms of, I guess, do all the research. Yeah. But then you actually have to have a conversation, yeah. right? And I think this is like where a lot of folks get really tripped up, particularly if they're early in their career, because you're supposed to have like this business conversation. Yeah. <laughs> right? And that's kind of scary. Like if you rely on product, you just throw a bunch of like features out there. So what are you doing just in terms of training your team to be able to be prepared to have that type of higher level conversation. Yeah, maybe I'll even take it a step back. Like you have to get that person to even talk to you before you get the opportunity <laughs> to have that conversation. Um, so in our call model, there's four parts, um, access, curiosity, credibility, and commitment. So access is the first part, making sure that you're, you're asking permission to continue, that you're actually getting that person to listen to what you have to say next. Um, the second curiosity is saying something that's it's compelling, right? Um, saying something that when they hear it, they nod their head and say, okay, I want to listen to what you have to say next. Um, from a credibility standpoint, there's a lot of things that you can say there, but that's where your research comes in. So do you know their company? Do you know the industry that they work in? Do you understand their competitive landscape? What are you gonna do that's different than the person that calls five minutes later or five minutes before? Um, and then finally, commitment and making sure that we're closing and following through on that. So that's sort of the framework we're looking at for securing a meeting. As far as how the actual conversation goes, we're spending a lot of time on active listening, open-ended questions. We're feeding these guys a pretty basic like basic set of questions that they can leverage to start that conversation. But then, you know, our team is specialized and they're spending a lot of time learning about the industry and shadowing reps and figuring out how do they better themselves and learn as much as they can in that conversation to set a good meeting for the next person. So just a, the recap, like it, basically that first conversation yeah. was what were like the four steps? Yeah, access, access curiosity, curiosity, credibility, credibility, credibility commitment. Commitment. Yeah. All right. You're writing it down. It's, it's <laughs> good. Uh, 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 and making sure. I'm going to test you later. But um, so once I had that conversation, yeah. What's kind of the the cases <clears throat> that you know, folks are following up on? You know, in terms of phone versus email versus social media because you hear like all these different ways of accessing and you know I'm good friends with a lot of folks like yeah. Joe Raleigh's of the world right and talk a lot about social selling but what does that mean in terms of the context that 
your building, in terms of your team, like how are you lever leveraging things like social yeah. or email in addition to calls? Sure. So I I'm going to start by being super honest here and telling you we're probably like the least automated <laughs> company that you will see from a lead gen standpoint. We rely very heavily on our individual BDRs running their own territory and their own prospecting plans. So we provide a lot of ideas and guidance around what that should look like, but it's, we're not using um, something like a Cloud app that's going to automate sure. a lot of that process for us. Um, so from our low technology view of this, um, emails and phone calls and in mail and social all have this really an equal footing in what we're doing. Um, we believe in making the dials. Yeah, and it's not, none of this like you know cold calling is dead stuff. No, none of that. <laughs> yeah. No, and I think actually it's making a resurgence. So one of the things that you know. The concept of inbound marketing, it's cheaper, it's generating volume and leads for us. We're absolutely using that, but you know, outbound prospecting is a lot more proactive. We're getting to the companies sooner. We're making sure we're getting into deals and getting invited to the table that we weren't at before. Um, so no, we're certainly encouraging people to use a specific touch plan. We, we do use the double tap, phone and email are being used together. And we're looking at a pretty tight cadence. So on a outbound, brand new lead, we'll look at a minimum of three contacts, um, five or six touches each in the span of about 20 business days. So about a month, yeah. And are, are folks leaving voicemails? Is that? I'm there, encouraging there seems, them too. I don't know like if this they are. <laughs> voicemail, no voicemail. I, I don't know one way or the other. It seems like you either do or you don't. Yeah. And whatever works for you works. I, I definitely encourage people too. I look at it as, like, as somebody who receives a lot of sales calls. If all I do is listen to the first 10 seconds and hear your name, it might trigger me to read your email later, right? I've heard Bob call me seven times in the last four weeks, and when I get that next email from Bob, I might actually open it. Yeah. It can't hurt. No, no I mean, yeah, no, no, unless you have like a really bad voice. Yeah, fair or, enough. Hi, this is Rob, rah, 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 rah. I've, heard, so I've got some of those. I've, I've, I've gotten some of those. I'm like, well, what? What, what is, is this? this? But then you listen all the way to the end and save it, right? Well, of course, I got, I got an example I, later. I, I got to share it with Steve. Yeah. <laughs> like, gee, Steve, you listen to this call? Get in there. Here's the customer for you. Um, <laughs> I actually do that. You know, it's funny because I, I, I'll receive a lot of these emails and they're, just like, they're so bad. Yeah. They're so, I mean, really? Yeah. Do you ever like, I've, I've actually replied to some of these folks, like, this is really bad. Like, <laughs> there's, there's like three things you need to do. Could you just change it. Yeah. My name's actually Elizabeth. <laughs> Hi, comma. <laughs> I think I think one of these one of these sessions we'll just have, like have we'll just talk about like really bad emails. You know? I just built a PowerPoint deck for our next training, and we oh literally God. I just I have a folder of them. Every time I get one, I save them. And there's some good, there's some bad, and there's some ugly. But like we just made a deck of probably 60 emails in the last year that I've gotten. There's some magic in there. Like really good stuff. <laughs> if anyone has any questions about you know, I've, I've seen them all, and I actually I know a lot of folks that could help. So please, like, no more bad emails. But um, but it's, just, it's so easy, right? Because sales automation, like you say you're low tech, but to me, like, that makes you your effort a lot more personalized. Yeah. Right. It's easy to use templates. I, mean, I don't know about you, but I feel like we've just been relying so much on sales automation. We've gone away from actual like sales skills and mm -hmm. just teaching mm -hmm. people how to how to sell. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that you know, also comes to mind is, you know, I think if you're selling a, a low ticket item, it's a little bit of a different vibe. You know, doing the dials, you know, connecting with folks, you know, it seems like a shorter sales cycle. You have fairly long sales cycles because you're selling a fairly complex yeah. solution. I mean, what is kind of the strategy of, of getting into some of these larger companies? Mm -hmm. right? Because you have, you have some uh, maybe like SMB, some mid market customers, but you know, I, I see you doing a lot more work with bigger corporations. Mm -hmm. Is there any like, sort of like strategy or framework you have in mind? Yeah, so I guess I'll start and just say we're, for Mix, we're selling to like every size company in every industry, which I think is fairly unique. I think a lot of people have a more niche market yeah, than we do. We a um, wide, wide market. So we're very specialized. I think that's the most important thing I'll say is, you know, if you're calling into a 10 person distribution company and then a you know, 20,000 person consulting firm, your messaging is just gonna be all over the place. So our guys are really specialized. They either do inbound or outbound. Okay. They are specialized within an industry, within a company size band, and in some cases, even a geo. Um, so our goal is to make it kind of easy for them to have one message. And then how we work across those really differs. So if I'm talking about um, like our mid-market or smaller business space, a BDR will execute on their own 
whereas in our enterprise, like true like you know Forbes 1000 accounts, um, they're working different divisions and subsidiaries. Yeah, they're doing a divide and conquer team right. strategy with their rep, where they might be working sort of some subs and divisions on their own and working up, where a rep might be working down. And I think the key for us is actually planning what we're doing. So making sure that they have the list of accounts they're going after, that they've done their research on those accounts, you've done your homework, you know who you're targeting. And then I think the most important thing is that you have a reason to call. So, you know, if, whatever you want to call that, what's the hypothesis of need? Why do they, why are they going to listen to you today? And what are you going to say that's compelling and relevant? Um, if you don't have that, it's really not worth the activity. No, it's just, it's yeah. just more spam and noise, and it, mm -hmm. it, there's just so much of that already these days. So I want to get back to that original thing we were talking about, just growing this team. Growing, <laughs> yeah. Growing the team. Um, like nothing, and, and you call it, by the way, I mean, we talk, we talk about BDRs, or like business development yeah. reps, basically the equivalent of sales development reps. SDRs, ADRs, SDRs, yeah. Right. Um, what did you learn from that process? I mean, how did you even, like, begin because that's like a huge head count you have to set up a lot of like training and practices and processes yeah I mean I guess I'll start with hiring it's the most important thing I do I still spend probably more than 50% of my time hiring people and interviewing um, and that's levels removed now I'm still involved in most interviews um, hire in, in what we're doing I hire talent over experience like every single time so we're looking for people who have that motivation and drive. I've heard people call it different things, like grit, horsepower. Yeah, yeah grit seems to be grit, like, like the, the, the word du jour, yeah. right? Okay. Um, I'm sticking with horsepower, but people who are intelligent and who are motivated, and I, the way I look at it is, if you're smart, I can teach you how to do anything, right? But you've got to want it, and we can set up whatever fun culture around you with spiffs and incentives and this great team environment and a fun office and beer in the office we don't really do that um, but if you if you don't like wake up every day and think I'm gonna do better than I did the day before or, and see this job as a stepping stone to the next thing man like, you are gonna hate it like you have to have that internally um, yeah I mean it's yeah, I think that, you know, it's so critical right I mean you have to at least have you know some level of motivation you know, within yourself to be successful yeah. you really want to be in sales yeah. but I'd also say kind of conversely you know, there's a lot of times when it's you can it's get hard. really down, right? Yeah. Get really tiring. Like yeah. you know, nothing's going. You use it like, like you know, prospect you thought you had online. Mm -hmm. They don't show up for a meeting. <laughs> you know, what are you doing for you know, those reps? Or what What are you doing trying to just keep it fun, keep the spirit hot? Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of fun stuff in our office. I I've always described it as we kind of have three different cultures. We have our corporate culture, our office culture, and our team culture. And a lot of that is about the people that we hire and bring in. It comes sure. back to the people that are there. Um, but you know, there's company events, we do like lunches in the office, we do a lot of different like spiffs and contests, different call blocks where the entire office will call together and kind of band around a theme. Um, so, you know, a whole bunch of different things I think to keep the culture lively and fun and a lot of that we encourage our BDRs and reps to come up with an own on their own. Yeah. Yeah. So as you're scaling up the group and, yeah. and you're still scaling up today, I, it should be noted, I mean you're still yeah. hiring more and more reps. <laughs> hiring. 146 this year. Mm. So we are also hiring. <laughs> <laughs> so 146 BDRs? Yeah. Or how many sales? Uh, our ratio is about four to one on average. Okay. You know, one BDR to four reps. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I mean, it's, I mean, it's growth all, all across the board because you also have yeah. to have the yeah. reps yes. to get the leads, right? Okay. So it's amazing. So. What are the things that you may might have done differently? You know, now you're kind of <coughs> two years into it yeah. and 150, you know, direct re reports into. Yeah. What would you change? So one thing that we made a very conscious decision to do, but that I would rethink, is the locations we chose, and we we sort of looked at this in two ways. One, we were creating this lead gen team, but the second is we were like pushing culture and fun and this like young motivated energy into our offices and we started in Boston which was great and we hired 20 people there and we just saw the office like change and brighten up and liven up and it became this idea of like let's put this group in every single office that we can and then we'll graduate them and it will perpetuate itself and there's some huge wins with that 
but it's also a really hard team to manage when it's <laughs> spread out like that. Yeah. And there's some economies of scale of if I had like 30 people in one place instead of 10, rather like than all these different offices, it, it would be a little bit easier. Um, so we've gone back and forth on that. Um, beyond that, I, you know, I wish I knew then what I know now about the training side, but you know, it, it evolved right. and we've learned from every group, so there's really nothing to like regret there. Right. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing though, I mean, yeah. right? Otherwise, you know, we're not you know, taking that real, actually building something, we're gonna figure out that oh, things don't work, or this yeah. doesn't work, and you know, it's kind of interesting to see like, you know, pulling away from a product, because mm -hmm. I see a lot of, particularly a lot of startups, so product and feature mm -hmm. driven, but they don't really talk or really have a conversation around value. Right. And to your point, if you're not talking about value, if you're not talking about like what's in it for them, yeah. for the prospect, then you're going nowhere. The other portion of my team um, is training for pre-sales, so we're training solution consultants, and okay. so that is like super product heavy. Um, but it's interesting, we're having the same conversations there. These guys need to know the nitty gritty, they need to know how it works, they need to be able to hear requirements and match it to the solution. And still, the number one thing we're drilling into demos is value. Like, mm -hmm. why does that matter to the client? Why did you just show me that click path, right? And it's, if it doesn't matter, don't show it. Uh, so it's the same, kind of no matter where we are in that no, training it's, process. Yeah. No, it's good to have that rigor on that, I can't tell you, like, like demos. I literally had a pre-call, I said, okay, these are the three things I need to see. Oh, yeah. And then you do demo, it's like an hour later, and they, they've shown like the, the whole thing. It's, you gotta have like discipline around the, you know, the demos and product discussions and presentations, because they just go all over the place. Oh, it's funny, you said that before about like responding to somebody. I just sent a note to a head of sales of a company that I've been engaged with for like four months. I'm on my fourth demo and I've yet to see the one requirement that I've been saying since the beginning. <laughs> and I keep getting on the phone thinking like this time it's gonna happen. No. <laughs> yeah. Why do you keep getting on the phone? Because I need it. <laughs> yeah, it, it like, it, I'm, I'm going to buy it. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. It's, like, it's, it's almost like, like sales prevention strategies. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's so painful. Well, yeah, I, I can ask you know, all sorts of questions, but I want to, if anyone has questions, please, I mean, feel free. This is, this is our community, so if you have questions for Liz, please ask away. Um, sure, gentlemen. In, uh, give us your, your name, where you're from. Sure. Uh, Liz Ben, Salt Spot, and she's talking about sort of the three minutes for sourcing, just trying to figure out yeah. how much you want to put into it. You're talking about those personal emails as opposed to using uh, kind of template emails or stuff. You know, how much time do you putting into that? Because that can be even more time. Okay. Yep. Time putting into actually creating the emails themselves when you're not what using some sort of. Like, what are the bits you put like, in there? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I would say I actually am a huge proponent of templates with minor edits. So I'd look at it as you have this cadence of emails that you're going to send. And if you're targeting a growing software company, there are a few key things that you're going to say across all those different companies. And then there's probably one or two sentences that needs to change. So if you find an article about recent funding, like drop that into the first line and the rest of it stays the same. Your ask of them is always the same. So I feel like you can you can make it personal and relevant without spending too much time customizing. Or if you're at least in a market that is focused, you can use a lot of that research and building of those emails again and again. I guess a follow up to this, have you seen any sort of you know, things that worked around just email subject lines. Right? A lot of people talk about email subject yeah. lines and you know, debate it endlessly. I, I don't. I personally don't really see big differences. But have you seen any? Shorter is the only thing I, I will really weigh in on. Like, yeah, like uh, we get people that are like super excited about different subject lines. <laughs> Professional persistence seems to be one that like everybody replies to. I don't know why. Um, but like, so. Professional persistence. Yeah, and then the email basically says like, I'm sorry to keep bothering you, but. I got to. <laughs> right. Um, it, it's so shorter. Anything more than like four words seems to be like really problematic. Good question over here. Yeah. So my name's Dan. I'm from Inside Squared. So welcome to our office. <laughs> nice. Um, you said there's a four to one ratio. I was just kind of curious. Is there like promotional tracks? Like, how do you motivate reps? Because obviously, yeah. like the BDR role is really. <laughs> yes, um, it is, I agree. So uh, the question was with 41 ratio, what is the promotion path? 
We are a really unique company in how we do our planning. So if you think about the number of BDRs you're gonna hire, you could do it in a lot of different ways. You could think about the number of leads you need to generate. You could back into what percentage of your revenue you want to come to that team. Um, one of the things we look at is actually how many people we need to promote each year. So we look at how many rep recs we're gonna fill with the people that graduate from this program, plan for attrition, and then make sure we're hiring enough to fill those spots. So in our world, it, basically is if you earn it you can get that promotion like there are not four people vying for one spot there are enough spots and the, the hope would be that we can push everybody into one of those roles in the 12 to 18 month time span. So is there like ongoing meetings that take place so they know the track that they're on and like where, I yeah. where they lie? So there's a couple of natural paths for our guys, whether it's like direct field sales, account management on the retention side or um, into our channel model. And in each of those, we're, we're working with the managers and the BDRs to start to self-identify into what path they think they're gonna be successful on. So their interest is number one. Um, their perceived skill set is the second. <laughs> so if somebody is saying like, all I wanna do is go into field sales and they've never hit their number on meetings, like that doesn't seem like a great path, right? Um, and the third is really figuring out the needs of the business. So if we have a year where we really need to bolster up our account management organization, we're gonna put more people there and we're gonna encourage them to take that path. So there's kind of a, a mix of things that go into that decision. Yeah. So not all your BDRs actually go into a closing role, they actually like go into different parts of the company? Uh, those happen to all be closing roles, so we're actually looking to put them all into quota bearing if we can, okay. just different parts of the business, yeah. Okay. I guess like, like the channel, the field sales field. versus okay. account management, yeah, it's a mix. Okay. Chris, I'm Anita with Level 3. We're in a room full of salespeople. We love role plays, right? <laughs> role plays are awesome. Uh, so we have access, and then we have um, credibility, right? So you talked about and then commit. There's three C's, weren't there? I'm missing one. Curiosity. 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 So yeah. make them curious, right? Do you mind just showing us an example of how you, or maybe one of your reps wants to stand <laughs> up and just show us oh, how you ooh. go through that, that uh, role play? Sure. Um, role play. Anybody want to volunteer for that? It's like really putting people on the spot. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll do it. Do you, want to do it you guys want to do it? No, me and Emma can do it together. Yeah, yeah that'd be awesome. Kelly, you do it with Liz. Let's do it together. Or <laughs> on a joint call? Yeah. No, you could be the customer and I could, or we could. All right, yeah, I'll be the. I'll be the. Here, why don't we? Nah, you, these, you, are, you, these are going to be awesome. <laughs> I want to see you guys do this. Yeah. This is the first live. Uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 And then it goes to a BDR alumni account manager, <laughs> and you see that scope, and especially the young breed in the company driving it and being in on, on all the rewards and awards and recognitions and such. Uh, so that's really motivating, and that's what the program yields. So that's good. So be the customer or the rep? I'll be the customer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, and I'm really busy. <laughs> I am really busy. <laughs> ring, ring. Uh, this is Nima speaking. Hi, Nima. Good to, can I hit you a good time? Um, busy, but what's up? Hi, this is uh, Kelly Lampkin. I think you might have received a couple of my emails the last couple weeks. I receive a lot of emails, but yeah, I think so. I'm with NetSuite. I'm calling about uh, your financial accounting software. I understand that you're using QuickBooks today. Did a little bit of research on your business. Sounds like you guys are growing really fast. I wanted to see if it might be a good opportunity to talk about potentially scaling uh, with our software to help you guys hit that next level of growth. Yeah, we are scaling. Now is not the best opportunity, but I have heard of NetSuite before. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. Thanks. Um, I was, the reason I was calling is because uh, we actually just finished working on a project with, I believe, one of your partners. Uh, Salsify is a, a customer of ours, and we were just working on a project with them. I thought maybe, I think you know a couple of their executives? Uh, yeah, I do. 
Yeah, great. So what we did with Salsify a couple weeks ago is they were using QuickBooks, Bill.com, a lot of spreadsheets for the revenue recognition. And what we were able to do with them is migrate them onto the NetSuite cloud, and today their close time dropped from about 30 days to less than five. Does that sound like something you might want to talk a little bit more about for your company? Uh, yeah, that sounds pretty compelling. When can we meet? <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> First live role play ever in the history of the Enterprise Hills Meetup. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was great. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Nima. True story also. Salsify is a customer that we signed. There you go. And Salsify is back there, so props to Salsify for being on the NetSuite cloud. Um, so follow up on that really quickly. She asked for permission to continue, so that's the that's access. Right. Uh -huh. um, the credit. Uh, Wait, curiosity yes. is next, so she's saying something that like encourages that person to listen about like, you know, what do we do for your competitors? What do we do in your space? And then from a um, credibility standpoint, she can talk about a customer or a partner who's in their space and what they actually did for their business. Yeah, and then I would add to that the one thing is like the universal truth of like scalability yeah. and things that mm -hmm. like every executive would want. So mm -hmm. saying like, do I want that? Yeah, that sounds like something I want. It's, it would be Ask me a question that the person has to go like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, it's it's, it's kind of like almost the, the, no, when you go on those websites it. and they ask you for an email that says, you know, do you want to be smarter around how to sell? Yeah. Well, well, no, of course not. No, I'm going to click no. no. Right? <laughs> but no, that's a really good point. It's yep. you know, so you saying guys, things that are compelling. So you guys recommend always opening with yes or no question like that? No, I, and, and actually I think there's a lot of flexibility in how you do that. Um, it works for some people. We encourage people to find the way to gain access. Um, mm -hmm. I can happy to suggest a few ways, but there's definitely different schools of thought on that. I think what we try to avoid is just barreling into it. Right. So, Marty. So, um, Marty. Name. My, my name's Marty. I stood up before. <laughs> I'm looking for some sales folks. Um, do you do this internally, the role play? Yeah. How we often? Do a lot of it. How often, tell me what the cadence is, tell me the structure of that, tell me how you manage that. Yeah, I don't manage it a well, lot tell anymore, me how it's managed. but um, we do a ton of role play early on. We're actually just putting together a certification for the first time mm -hmm. for our training. Um, it used to be that you did a qual call with me, which was very scary. Um, and now it, we actually will certify them um, in this first round of training with that process. Um, it, role play is pretty regular. We also record phone calls um, on our inbound line and are listening to those back and try to capture it, listen to it with some of the reps. So um, in this role play here, obviously you understand a customer and you were brilliant at that role. <laughs> so you've, you've had that experience. Yeah. So when you do the role play, do you bring in somebody who's more who's had that exposure to somebody who is just learning? Uh, you're not just learning, but do you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. do, you, do, you, do you put that tension in front to make sure, or do you just bring in the same kind of people, let's, let's role play? There's definitely a mix. Okay. Um, I think that a lot of it is actually internal within the teams. Some of it is with their managers who have different backgrounds and experience. Um, when I do it, it certainly sounds a lot meaner and even closer <laughs> probably for what you did there. Um, but it, you know, I think it depends on the individual we're working on. But yeah, we certainly involve other people as needed. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, with, uh, gentleman in the back, he had his hand up first. Oh, uh, Matt Begley, I'm actually a PR at Uh The one question I have is, are your current clients okay with you uh, using your names in another deal? <laughs> access? That was, should not have been a laugh. Um, we <laughs> encourage our BDRs to use the people who have published case studies on our website. Oh, okay. um, right. And in some well, cases where somebody is like yeah. has a close relationship with the company and has closed that deal and yeah, knows them, rare. sure. Um, but on our on our team, it's used with published. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's going to have a follow up because if you made that, let's use this as a real life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your three by three study is you've contacted him and knows that. He knows him, yeah. mm -hmm. so that's why you did that. For sure, every yeah. single okay. deal will do that. Yeah. yeah. In the back. <laughs> and, and your name? Sure. So what, what's so what's your cadence? Yeah, what's the cadence? So an email and voicemail on day one, an email and voicemail on day two. Feel free to use 
InMail interchangeably with email, and we use InMail a lot. Mm -hmm. um, to your point, make sure you reply to your own emails and create a thread, not just starting from scratch every time. Uh, four to five days later, another email and voicemail. Four to five days after that, another email and voicemail. And now you're at 12 business days, and then we'll spread it out a little bit more and move to thought leadership. The key, though, for us is we focus on what we call war dials. So the idea is that you're calling that company far more regularly than you're leaving voicemails and fingerprints. Like a fingerprint is something you leave behind. You could call seven times in one day, and if that person never picks up, like there's there's nothing there, right? So we're encouraging people to use, we call it a hot list, but dial through your list. And if it's clean and you've done your research and you have direct dials, you should be able to put down like 50 calls in the span of probably an hour, right? There, get a couple of connections and keep going. Um, so it, I think the, the regular dial concept is the thing that I would continue to encourage people to do. Getting somebody live, that rapport you build, is so much better than an email meeting. Uh, Bob. Yeah. Uh, Bob Sassoni, Systems. What's the system? We use NetSuite. We drink our own Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It just out of curiosity, are there any, are there any, yeah, are there any other tools that you use? You know, you're not using things like Tout App yeah. or whatever, but are there things that have come up that you have found useful? Yeah, so we use a few things. Um, we use a company called Leadspace for contact research. I mentioned that one. It's, um, it, there's a whole bunch of people doing that. It's basically scraping LinkedIn and other sources and providing detailed contact information. What I like about what they do is you build a very, a very like discreet profile. And so, you know, I spent time building these in the beginning. I built seven of them. So I know that if I'm selling to a distribution company, depending on the size of the company, I want a different level of contact and I care about different titles and job responsibilities. So you build this profile, and then when you go to prospect and you're a BDR and you type in that you are looking at a, a whatever name of the company, it's a 200 person distribution company, the system automatically pulls back the four contacts that might be relevant to you, rather than spitting back all 200 employees on LinkedIn. Right. It's cool. Um, so that's a big one, big time investment up front to get it set up right, but pretty cool output. Um, and then beyond that, we, I mean, we live on LinkedIn Sales Navigator. It's huge for us. Um, and we're actually just deploying something called Seismic for content management, oh, yeah. where we're trying to do um, more like dynamic creation of content. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to be like this, uh, this ongoing you know, conversation just around you know, leveraging content yeah. better and trying to be a little more creative and mm -hmm. you know, allowing like, a little bit more flexibility just from the, the sales rep mm -hmm. perspective on what makes sense and what's relevant right. based on the conversation. Right. Yeah. Sorry, there's a... I'm Kevin Frost, for North USA. We make extra graphic research instruments. So, I know this is kind of all prospecting, but once you get the client interested and maybe send them a quote or something, what what's your you know your, your timeline on maybe following up or have heard from them? You know, where, where do you go from there? Yeah, it's, it's the big black hole of uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you send the quote and then it goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, hand that off. Who wants it? <laughs> Please. Uh, uh, my name is Martin Rich. My company is Martell Communications, and we're a startup. Uh, basically, I'm a big advocate on you need to earn the right to ask for the business. Mm -hmm. And this concept of leaving a, a quote or leaving a proposal with a customer and walking away, if you haven't asked for that business at the time that you've brought them or dropped that, then you're basically doing yourself a disservice. Now, by the same token, you need to build your own case and you need to earn the right to ask for the business. And so many folks go out there and they do leave these proposals, but they're really not quite ready and really they haven't built their case to ask for that business. So what ends up happening is they're running scared. They're afraid to ask, but they know the reason they're afraid to ask is because they could ask all day long. If they haven't built that case and they don't have the right to ask for the business, they're not going to get it. I yeah. no, really, really appreciate that, Martin. There, there's actually a, there's, there's really two sides of that question, right? It's before what led up to sending the quote. Mm -hmm. So maybe you weren't really well positioned and you were just column fodder generally happens a lot, uh, particularly when you're starting to sell a lot of enterprise software. Have you guys software. heard that term? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, yeah. 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 yeah, column fodder is just the term, old time enterprise sales rep. Mm -hmm. uh, someone reaches out to you in the blue, or you kind of have a conversation, it's really later in the deal. What's your price? 
and it's all about what's your price. Mm -hmm. And you send a quote, and it's, that's exactly what happens because you are you are used to justify someone else's decision. Mm -hmm. uh, on the back end, uh, I actually helped a customer with this uh, recently. They were sending out quotes, and they never established any sort of commitment with the customer. Much to uh, Martin's point, you got to find a way of you know, building in that follow-up and just a simple act of creating, getting agreement when you have a conversation about sending a quote, say, I want to have a follow-up three days from now, or whatever time frame makes sense, and then literally send a calendar invite into their email. Mm -hmm. Like That alone addressed 25% of the follow-up that they had just, just in terms of quotes going out and never being responded to. So be proactive. People are asking for information. Don't just act, don't, just don't give. Try to build some level of commitment and some level of responsiveness back into, into the conversation so that you don't get kind of tossed aside or forgotten about. Hi, I'm Jackie Smith, and um, so I came from a kind of enterprise -y business. You may have heard of it, Oracle. <laughs> and um, I was a BDR, so. Oracle. What that <laughs> I don't mean before? Know. And now I'm at AppQs, which is a really small startup. And so NetSuite kind of falls right in the middle of that. And so I was kind of wondering, what's like the sweet spot for the amount of times that you can contact somebody before it becomes like way too annoying for the customer, <laughs> or then not enough? Because I know you had like your your 28 day plan. And yeah. So we look at it as like short sprints. So I I like this mindset idea that it's not not a question of if the customer is going to buy, but of when. So if you believe in your product and you can find the right time for that client, you, you will get into that deal. So for us, we're looking at it as like 20 to 22 business days and then like lay off, right? If they haven't responded at all or if they're telling you no, back off that for a while. Um, but that does mean that you have to be contacting multiple people. Hearing one no from one contact, like I wouldn't say that at all. But if you're making your way through the organization, you understand what that buying decision looks like, what the org looks like about a month and then I would take a break and like return to that if you feel like it's still a target fit for you. Um, it's a mix though, right? Like if you feel like there's really buying activity happening, at times you are just gonna be super persistent. Mm -hmm. um, I actually Thanks. had an example recently of a contact reaching out to me and he reached out to me, like it was the worst prospecting ever. Every single Monday at like nine o'clock, I would get the same email and I got it for like six months, right? Every single Monday at the same time. It was like clearly automated, but like somebody must've told him to do something different because one day he reached out to like four different people in our company and he reached out to our AVP of sales productivity, our VP of sales operations and my boss, our SVP of sales success. And in one week I had three people around me forward me the same email being like, this seems like you have to look into it. Like, <laughs> All right. Um, but I actually bought it in the end. So like the irony of it is like his persistence, I wouldn't encourage the way he did it on the front end, but his idea of going around me got me to ultimately respond. I, I don't know that there's like a great answer to that. So I know another example instead. <laughs> persistence can pay. Yeah. Um, but also using that network around people and not just focusing on the one contact you need, I think is pretty key. Yeah, I mean, well, particularly kind of when you're selling the enterprise, yeah. right? It's, you can't just sell the one person. You got to be able to figure out right. the natural organization. Uh, yeah. uh, gentlemen, uh, which yeah. one? Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, John Murdoch. Um, we're for Sentage. We're a company in Natick. We're also hiring. So um, I'm, I'm interested in the handoff process from the PR team to the <laughs> Yeah. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, what does that look like? Yeah. Um, what expectations are they setting with, you know, with your EEs or your, your, your account team? And then compensation, you know, how, how do you, sure. you know, how do you okay. create that? You know, so just to put a yeah. for folks on uh, online there on the live stream, uh, the handoff between hand ERs and AEs. is painful. Um, so in some cases where we have a really good cadence and relationship between the BDRs and the reps, they're actually physically booking that next meeting. And that is like the goal. I want commitment while they're on the phone. Like that is the ideal scenario. But there are a lot of things that prevent us from doing that. Um, people's calendars, 
people not showing up to meetings that are booked and that looks terrible for the client. So in some cases, we'll actually do an email handoff where we'll recap the conversation, introduce that person as the point of contact. And then like, if we don't see anything 24 hours later, we're like, you got to respond to that. <laughs> um, so we, we do follow it up. Um, ideally, it's a meeting. Usually it's yeah. an email. Yeah. And then you had a second question around compensation. compensation. Yeah, comp so are they compensated on the meeting, on the number of leads? Yeah. Um, so our team is compensated on a few different things. So I guess I'll start by saying, like, again, there's kind of two parts to our team. There's the lead generation and there's the talent. And so we're trying to build the right habits and also do a lot of training to prepare them for the next job. It's not just the lead number. So our variable compensation is tied about 60% to the actual number of meetings or leads that are promoted. It's about 20% based on like the touch plans and actually following the process that we've outlined as how you prospect and activity levels. And then there's um, another 20% of it that's more subjective and tied to training and delivering various checkpoints. The quality metric comes in at our management team, not at the BDR level. So they get a hard number and we carry conversion rate. We did that in our business because we have sales cycles that last longer than these people are in seat. <laughs> so I, I can have a BDR who's in seat for six months and never sees revenue influence, but is doing everything that we want them to do. It became very hard to design a long-term comp plan in that enterprise space. That makes sense. Yeah. I guess you know, a shorter, you know, a shorter sales a 30 cycle. 30-day sales yeah. cycle, yeah, like <laughs> comp yeah. moment. Um, and then, yeah, John, the next. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Anubhav. Anubhav, okay. So one of our big issues I face all this is key stakeholders, business, sourcing, and IT, which are very critical when I'm doing an yeah. IT product. And I'm looking at product and IT services both, not just a uh, sure. specific product. Now, always, which I've seen classic cases, sourcing has a different kind of effect and leverage across the organization. And so sometimes they say, walk through me to who you are talking to, keep me updated, and I want to know how you flow your process through. At the same time, we need to talk to business to understand the pain points because sourcing is lost in the end mm -hmm. for the process. So how do you navigate this dichotomy of sourcing, controlling how you want to go out to reach people and managing the relationship across business and IT? What are some of the ways that you have seen to navigate this? Mm -hmm. Kind of like, a, like almost like two questions. Like, you know, how do you deal with like the sourcing procurement mm -hmm. side when they want to own everything and then also yeah. talking to IT as well as talking to business? Yeah. Like, so I'll say from my team's perspective, we're focusing on more IT in the business as a way in the door. I think the conversation with sourcing and procurement is happening once we actually have a foothold with the business. That okay. tends to be how we're getting in. Okay. I don't know if anybody wants to counter me on that. No, you're nodding. Um, so our, our focus in getting the meeting is certainly on business and potentially IT with what we're selling because it's a large system that would replace something else. Um, and then I, I think that procurement piece and sourcing comes in a little bit later in the deal for us. So I, it's not where I you know, live every day. <laughs> my name is Justin Zangani, and my question is on hiring. You said you would hire uh, on talent or experience. What are some of the characteristics you look in the, when, you, when you hire for talent? When I hire for talent, yeah. I mean, most of the people I'm hiring are coming right out of college. Um, Although, actually, I, I would say this exact same thing for my management team. I have a lot of people that are first-time managers where we're looking for the qualities we want in a manager rather than 10 years of experience doing it. Um, when I'm looking at a BDR and what I'm hiring in that sort of entry-level salesperson, I, I have four pillars that I look at. Um, the first is sales skills, and so that means a lot of different things when we're hiring right out of college. It can mean that competitive drive, um, you know, we ask them questions like, tell me about the last time you lost, right? And it's interesting to see how people talk about that. Was it someone else's fault or did they learn something from it? Um, we want to hear about any competitive activities they had, whether it's sports, whether it's in school, like it, it doesn't really matter. I like to hear how they talk, right? How are you persuasive? Tell me about the last time you had to convince somebody to see something your way. What's your relationship with that person <coughs> now? Um, so we look at, the sales side first. Um, we're looking at cultural fit, that's pretty huge for us. Um, I have this word horsepower, grit, kind of the same thing. We're looking at um, really like their motivation and, and how they would perform in this job and what would get them excited. And then um, the last thing for me, I call it patterns of behavior, but I like to look at how people make decisions. 
And so I, I try to figure out you know, why did you go to the college that you went to? Did you go there because there was a particular major or a teacher or a class that you wanted to do? Or did you go there because your three older brothers went there? And maybe it's okay that your three older brothers went there, but did you have a better reason than that? <laughs> um, and so we're looking at, you know, why did you choose the jobs you did? Did you, maybe, maybe you had every opportunity in the world. What did you make of them, right? So your dad got you those three internships. Did you like dive in and work 60 hour weeks or did you sit back and coast? Um, we're looking at a pretty behavioral interview in like, kind of real terms. It's almost like you, you want to just figure out like how do you, you think? Yeah. Like, what's going on in that, that head of yours? Mm -hmm. do you what's your business drive? judgment going like, to be like? <laughs> exactly. Uh, I do want to apologize. We're running a bit uh, behind, but Liz, will you stay Happy stick to. around for a little yeah. bit? And I do, do want to ask, I ask this question all the time of every speaker. I just want to know, is there a book that inspires you that you've read recently or that yeah. you just always go to? Yeah, so my like one of my favorite business reads will pertain more to some people in this room than others, but it's a book called Who? And it's called A Method for Hiring. So it's hiring A talent basically. And it's a model for running your interview process. Awesome questions, awesome model. Um, a lot of what I do in our own hiring has been has come from that. Um, and their basic premise is that hiring mistakes and are the biggest problem companies have. Most managers have about a 50% hit rate. And that book is who? Who? Okay. Is <laughs> it fine? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to take uh, you know, some questions after a fact. Uh, and uh, why don't we just give a round of applause? This is really awesome. Thank you. Thank you.